our final presentation before uh, our discussion panel, our happy hour, and then our public lecture from Peter Becker. We have Larry Lauber and Peter Lonsdale joining us um, to talk about heat flow and diving in the Gulf of California, as well as their current activities and plate tectonics. So Peter Lonsdale has been with us at Scripps since around 1969, uh, where he began as a graduate student after receiving a bachelor's degree from Cambridge, where he studied uh, what they call geography, which I was a bit confused at first, until he told me that in the States we call that geomorphology. Uh, Peter Alonso has a, had an illustrious career in marine geology, particularly in the borderlands of California and the Gulf of California, uh, which has led to shift time that most of his graduate students come to dream of, and he's been a big proponent of getting his graduate students out at sea at any time possible, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, we also have Larry Lauber joining us today, who is currently a senior research scientist at the Institute for Geophysics at my alma mater, uh, the University of Texas at Austin. And in lieu of a more traditional introduction, which he will be covering in his talk, Larry asked to simply be introduced as a self-described obnoxious SOB. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming, me, welcoming Larry here. Okay, uh, this is really a talk about coming of age in the uh, tectonic, plate tectonic revolution. And, uh, all right. And I like this map from Vaselli, uh, which shows the uh, Gulf of California as the Vermilion Sea, because back in 1561, they had this relatively correct, and then in the 17th century, there was almost 100 years where California was an island until uh, Padre Kino actually walked from Mexico to California and proved that uh, it was no longer an island. <laughs> anyway, uh, my connection to Scripps actually goes back to this paper that my grandfather wrote about sand transport on the Scripps beach, which was in science, and he was arguing that it was transported uh, north-south seasonally and then south back to north. And this paper so incensed uh, Fran Shepard that he wrote a reply. And in the reply, he, uh, he said that uh, it is to be hoped that in the future, Mr. Reichold will make some attempts to make facts before he takes his wild ideas loose on the scientific public. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, Fran Shepard was so convinced that the man was transported in and out seasonally, and if they bothered talking to each other and discussing the whole thing, they might have come up with a right answer, but it took a lot longer time to get the same transport of Scripps Beach correct. Anyway, my grandfather was also a friend of Harold Sparrow, and so uh, that explains why when, uh, when I was a senior in high school in 1966, I applied to two colleges, and one was UC San Diego, and I came down to UC San Diego, toured the campus, and then I came down to the graduate student office at Scripps, and wanted to know whether or not Scripps discriminated against UCSD undergraduates when they admitted students. And luckily, I wasn't thrown out of the office, and they actually made an appointment with the graduate student advisor for me to talk to. And the guy said, well, there's only been two classes of graduates, and we're not even sure anybody's applied to Scripps, so we don't know. And since the other college that you applied to was actually OK, I should probably go there instead. <laughs> and so, that's why I wound up taking Geology 1 from Bill Dickinson. And even as late as 1964, he was writing papers about the pre-Cenozoic history of Oregon implications for geosynclinal theory. And one of the questions that somebody asked early this morning was, uh, what, what were people thinking about before plate tectonics? Well, there was this, of course, major paper by Marshall Kay about uh, geosynclines, and uh, permit me to say that in those days it was really kind of interesting because they actually referenced the uh, person that did the illustration, of course, the nice little zephyrs and clouds down here. And uh, Bob Fisher likes to tell a story about in the late 1950s that Howard Taylor was an illustrator here at Scripps, and every once in a while he could wander down the hallway, and Howard's younger sister uh, Elizabeth Taylor would walk down the hall and be Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Which things have changed nowadays. There'd be security guards and traffic would be stopped. <laughs> but anyway, um, Ron Oxborough would, you know, there were generations of British geologists that spent their life mapping the Alps. And 
without plate tectonics, I don't see how anybody could possibly understand this stack of stuff. And it's just, you know, without plate tectonics, you know, this couldn't have existed. But even as late as 1966, uh, Bob Dietz and Holden had this, you know, things in which if you want, someday I can tell you about geosynclines, but Bob Fisher can probably tell us a lot more. But can you imagine publishing in a mainstream journal <laughs> having a lot of this monster wandering around on your figure? So, this is basically where I came from. But there's been no mention, much to my surprise, of Frank Taylor, although he was referenced once. But uh, he had this paper in 1910 in GSA Bulletin where he actually got the motion of Greenland away from North America fairly correct with the opening of the Labrador Sea and Baffin Bay, and of course offset along what ironically became known as the Wegener uh, Fault, and it probably should be the Taylor Fault there. But in, uh, when I was taking this class from Bill Dickinson, you know, I said to one of the TAs in the lab, I said, this vertical tectonics just doesn't make any sense. I don't understand it. And the TA sort of looked around, because this geology one is rocks for jocks. So I think there were four majors out of 100 students there. And the TA looked at me, and he sort of looked around and said, well, if you promise not to tell anybody, this is what's really going on. And he started talking about plate tectonics, because just a couple of months before, Bill Dickinson Bill Dickinson and Art Grant had had this symposium at Stanford where they talked about 400 people at this conference on geological problems in San Andreas Fault System. Well, the problems were the fact that there was absolutely irrefutable evidence that there hadn't been 250 to 300 kilometers of right lateral offset on the San Andreas Fault at this time. And I like this figure from Warren Atkins' uh, chapter in this conference proceedings, where he was looking at uh, oligocene molluscan fauna from the Lincoln stage. And you can see down here, it matches this right up here. I mean, there's no way you could explain this with vertical tectonics at all. Mm -hmm. And of course, Wegener, in his 1929 book, actually had right lateral offset on the San Andreas Fault. So, and then at the same time, I wound up taking geophysics from George Thompson and Alan Cox, and of course most of it from Alan Cox, who was paleomagnetism, and they were putting together the uh, time scale of that time in 63 and 64 with the uh, changes in the declination. Uh, but no, there's no Jaramillo event in this paper here. And I, I will add one minor thing. I was hesitant to put in the slide because Alan Cox, about 20 years later, committed suicide just about before he was being arrested for by the Child Protective Services. So, uh, anyway, of course, everybody knows this Bullard Edgar Smith fit. And so the, this was work that uh, Vic Vaki and uh, Art Raff and Warren, Robert Warren published in 1981, and the thing that should be noted here was that they had things correct in time, but the dashed vertical line represents the axis of a north-south anomaly, which was continuous before slipping started. So they almost had it correct. And it's really impressive to see the offset from 1,150 kilometers across the Mendocino fracture zone, and of course the Pioneer fracture zone, and then you move them all back and they wind up, and it, and it doesn't take a brilliant person to see how, you know, obviously those things could be uh, correlated. And what's interesting is they actually had some very nice lines that went across the spreading center here, but the problem was that the Gorda plate was getting so mushed around because of the subduction that they probably missed the uh, fact that there was uh, symmetrical anomalies. So how did continental drift become plate tectonics? Well, Roger actually showed that uh, pretty closely, but 
you know, if you haven't read the book, there's a chapter in The Hunt for Red October where they describe the uh, Russian submarine trying to defect to the U.S. being chased by another Russian submarine. And uh, it explains why the Office of Naval Research was uh, funding all of this, uh, these huge, I mean, those lines that Vic's paper was about, those are boring as could be. You know, run 1,500 kilometers east-west, turn north for 60 kilometers, and run back 1,500 kilometers. But by taking the magnetics and the, uh, the gravity and the bathymetry, they were able to come up with uh, the fact that this Russian submarine in the book, if you read the chapter, it's really great, and they're running down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and they were keeping themselves on the largest positive magnetic. And as soon as they deviated off it, they knew that they had to switch back. And so that's how they were able to uh, elude people, because if they were had any sort of pinging or anything like that, they'd be shot out of the water by the Russian sub that was chasing them, or the US sub that was trying to find them. And so we owe a lot to the Office of Naval Research for funded all those boring magnetic profiles, as well as the CSAT, the GSAT. So, um, I really like this quote that was about from Fred Vine, and it was basically the critical thing at that meeting was that I met Brent Dalrymple for the first time. He told me in private discussion between sessions, we think that we have sharpened up the polarity reversal scale a bit, but in particular, we've defined a new event the Jaramillo event, which he then said that uh, he realized that they could come with constant spreading and actually wind up mapping most of the rest of the world. So, it's the same thing. Roger Larson, Bill Menard, and Stu Smith had a paper in 1968 and with the, about the uh, result of uh, ocean floor spreading in the trans transform fault. And they actually had the Harmonio event because uh, Brent Dalrymple, et cetera, had been able to add it in. So, anyway, so then in the fall of 1970, I arrived at Scripps for graduate school. Fran Shepard was still on the faculty, and I did not really know who my grandfather was until after I got my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the first quarter working with Russ Rate and George Shore picking sites for fraction arrivals for their anisotropy anti studies which was incredibly boring. And there were three of us who were graduate students. They were all getting paid to do this. The other two quit after the first year. <laughs> and uh, then I discovered what John was doing and switched advisors. So thank you, John, for that. And so when I arrived here, of course, from, from the work with Bill Dickinson and company down in San Andreas and the stuff with Rick Bakke and others, and, our graph and basin had done up here. Um, you know, we had a pretty good handle on what was going on. And then the San Andreas wound up going into the Gulf of California, and we didn't really know what was going on there. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, include this. There was a, a really great volume on the uh, marine geology of the Gulf of California edited by Gary Van Andel and George Shore that came out in 1964 as an AAPG volume. And this is the total abstract for this paper by Gene Rusnak and Bob Fisher. And what I like about it is they say here, the Gulf of California supposedly evolved as fractured plates of crustal material moved northwestward and Pacificward by gravitational sliding on extremely gentle slopes from the regions of western Mexico uplifted by bathymetric intrusions, which is basically trying to fit all this into myogeosynclines and eugeosynclines. And uh, what I do like is that they, they basically said, this rise is the present expression of a subcrustal wealth that reaches the North American continent near the south end of the Gulf of California, as de demonstrated by the work of Menard and others. So they were basically saying that, okay, we know that there had to have been something other than gravitational sliding that produced all this. So the, uh, 
there are a couple of papers. Uh, this is just to set the stage for the Gulf of California. But the, other, the important thing is to note that this map of the Gulf of California was actually produced by Bob Fisher and wound up as, I think, three large plates in the back of this volume. And you can wind up seeing, you know, really nice what turned out to be spreading centers and essentially long offset transform faults long before we really realized what was going on in the Gulf of California. And so the other important factor was a paper by Dick Phillips in, in the same volume on seismic refraction studies in the Gulf of California. And the uh, stations 21 and 20 are down here at the mouth of the Gulf, and then it goes up to station one up here at the north end of the Gulf. And you can see that the oceanic crust essentially reaches almost into the Carmen Basin. This reminds me, I just wanted to have the important names here are that in the south is the Pescadero Basin, Carmen Basin, the Farawa Basin, and Carmen Basin, and the Wineless Basin up to the north. And so you can see that the oceanic crust goes essentially up into the Carmen Basin, and then by the time you get to the Wineless Basin, you have sort of oceanic crust on this side of it going up to thicker crust here, and then by the time you get up to the Wagner Basin, you get pretty much continental crust. And uh, this data, some of the data up here, actually in the salt and trough, uh, had to do with a paper on geophysical investigations in the Colorado Delta region. And what's interesting is Bob Kovac, Clarence Allen, and Frank Press. I mean, what a group of co-authors you can have on paper. And they quoted seismic refraction data indicated depth of about 21,000 feet to basement near the head of the Gulf of California opposite San Felipe. George Shore personal communication. Our seismic results reveal basement depths ranging from 10,000 to 15,000 feet in the Imperial Valley region of the Colorado Delta, the greatest depths being indicated near the international border, which is this one up here. <coughs> in fact, uh, from Dick Phillips' stuff, it looks like there is you know, pushing four and a half to five kilometers of sediment here in the northern Gulf. And so um, it appeared that the sedimentation here was probably closer to what they had found up in the salt trough. But what's astonishing is this is all plyopleistocene sediments. And so when you're rifting continents, you're just dumping all this material in. And so it makes things pretty <coughs> pretty difficult to get through. Anyway, continental material essentially up here, oceanic material down here. And, oh, I throw in, this is a, a, a paid political advertisement. These are some of the cruises that I had gone on. And one of the first ones that I had gone on was a cruise that was built as a student cruise with Jim Hawkins. And basically, all the first year students went out on this cruise. We had a five-day field trip to Samoa and then went out on a 30-day cruise. And some of the students here complain that they can't get out on a ship and they can't go to sea. And it's really sad that that's the case. Anyway, um, in 1972, in the Gulf of California, I was out on Hypogene Lakes 2 and 3, which were the chief scientist was Teddy Bullard. And there were all sorts of very important co-chief scientists. And then you finally got down to the very list, bottom of the list, and there were a few graduate students out there. And I think I was out there for 30 days and maybe about 18 hours worth of station time out of the whole thing. And then again, in 73, we had six weeks on the Conestota with George Sharman and Mike Reichley. Again, as other people have noticed, mentioned uh, three graduates, no adult so supervision, and we went out there and collected our thesis data. And then we finally went out with Dick von Hertz and the Multi Penetration Probe in 74. <coughs> And then later in 77, I was diving with uh, Seacliff, with Peter Wansdale, and then uh, a lot more data was collected in, in 1978. So uh, in 63, Dick von Herzen had, I think, had most four peak flow measurements up here in the central Wines Basin area. And 
you've seen this number here. These are all the, heat flow, the old heat flow units, but it's basically milliwatts per meter squared. They're about uh, 140 to 160 or 70. And then from 1973, you know, we collected these data on the Melville crews, and the problem was there wasn't enough heat coming out. And uh, I thought Roger was going to talk about hydrothermal convection, so I didn't really throw in much of this, but the, the thought was that you go go for California with a sediment cover, you should have mostly conductive heat flow rather than convective heat flow. Heat flow. And um, this is from Dave Williams, Dick von Hertz, and John Slater, and Roger on um, work across these specific rides where they came up and found very nice convective cells in the crust. And in this early work that we did, you know, this is sort of the theoretical heat flow that we should have been coming up with in heat flow units, and there just wasn't enough there. And so that, you know, one had to figure out where in the white world the rest of the heat was going. And then in the Fairlawn Basin, you know, even though the, the deep spreading center appeared to be here, uh, we didn't get very high heat flow, and the highest heat flow was sort of offset to the south, where we actually got up to about uh, 300 milliwatts per meter squared. And then finally, we got the multi-penetration uh, probe and went, did a profile across the south, uh, southern part of the Wyoming Basin and, and got values that were up to uh, 30.7 uh, heat flow units or almost a watt, a one and a half watts per meter squared. So it was starting to look closer to the theoretical curves here. And wrote this paper in 75. And uh, for just, you know, I was a graduate student at the time. It was published in Nature. It's the only paper I've had in Nature. And it's had virtually no citations. So <laughs> publishing in Nature does not prove anything. <laughs> anyway, and concluded that you, know, you could model this by a dike, but it wasn't a nice standards rapidly spreading thing. Um, and then eventually, um, uh, Dave Williams and, and Kier Becker, et cetera, we published a paper in 79 where we had a lot more of these uh, multi penetration profiles across here. And what's interesting is actually published down here uh, that uh, in JDR, and this is just photographs of the seismic profile here. And I wish that when Peter and I were diving in 77 that we had had something like this because you could actually see the hydrothermal vents coming up. And this one in the uh, northern uh, Wyoming space, and you can see here, I mean, that's actually the plume coming up there. And if we'd known that, we would have not wasted all our time diving in, in kind of dead things. But anyway, uh, eventually, Kier Becker and uh, Andy Fisher published some, some of the numbers, and they, they were able to get uh, two and a half watts per meter squared up in the northern uh, part of the Wyoming Basin. And, and in the southern half, they got six and a quarter watts per meter squared, and they actually got almost nine watts per meter squared coming out. And so that was starting to, to say that, OK, we're starting to find a lot of heat coming out, and they were starting to identify the, uh, the hydrothermal vents, and actually uh, Andy and, and Kier Becker wound up doing this really nice diagram showing the um, amount of uh, flow on various things based on upward flow and, and recharge down, stuff like that. And here in the southern basin, they actually have a profile going from F up here to F prime, which runs across here, and they had sills that they've been able to identify, it. and you can see that you know, some of the very highest values coincided with the sills. And this was, Kira will be talking about deep sea drilling and ODP, and they drilled in, in the Wyoming Basin. And luckily, when Peter and I dove, we didn't find the hydrothermal vents, and if we had, they probably would have never allowed the drilling there 
and because when they drilled, they wound up melting the core and stuff, the core liners and stuff like that, probably would have violated every safety standard for going on. So anyway, um, and then in the northern uh, basin, we just didn't see the amount of uh, very spectacular high heat flow that was found in the southern basin. Uh, and then I'll mention this, this is uh, relatively recent uh, heat flow data from the people at Sassessi, and they actually came up with 15 watts per meter squared, which I don't know if that's the highest heat flow value ever measured, but uh, mm -hmm. it's getting up there. Uh, and then um, I was going to at one point turn this over to Peter, but I think I better hurry along. We want to get to uh, beer hour. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, what I do now, I, you know, as a number of people have said, you know, I haven't really thought about heat flow in Gulf of California in 35 years. And so I have done a lot of work in plate tectonics, and some of it I've worked on recently is Cuba, and you have the Bahamas platform here and these nice, you know, uh, flat line uh, sediments over the Bahamas platform, but then you have these ultramafics and uh, volcanic arcs and synorigenic basins. And without plate tectonics, I don't think we could have understood any of this stuff because, in fact, what was going on is as the ocean uh, was created, and this is the northern part of Cuba here. The rest of Cuba doesn't even exist in, you know, until later on, and then eventually there is some of the material that, that winds up, these are large metamorphic provinces of Cuba that have, were probably formed here off the southern margin of Yucatan. This is also part of Cuba here as part of the Caribbean arc. It comes in with the Caribbean plate and then smashes itself together at that point. And then, of course, the oceanic crust comes in. Now, recently, you know, since I was giving this talk here, I said, well, it would be really nice to be able to show this for the last 40 million years off of California. And so with Paleo GIS, we can actually put a bunch of any, any geology, any site sections, any drill cores, anything like that. And uh, so this is what's going on, and about uh, 25 20, uh, million years ago, uh, this was subducted here, and, and then the trench was shut off, and then of course, Pacific Plate is going northwards, and then Gulf of California opening here. And one of the things that's interesting is we, we tried to do this you know, color coding the ocean floor, and then we realized that we could bend the, the uh, magnetic anomaly picks, some of which were Jeff Severinghausen and Tanya Atwater's picks, which we still use. And we were able to figure out a way to, to take those in a one degree grid. You can see the one degree grids here and assign an age to it and color cut it. And so that's why it can come out looking relatively nice straightforward as the things age with time. And then, uh, anyway, uh, quick, very quick diving. Uh, this is the sea cliff diving. This first dive here was uh, that's shown was, it was dive 309, which is in the western end of the northern trough. The next one is in the eastern side where uh, now, the trouble with diving on with the, this uh, sea turtle is that um, it didn't have a working size can sonar, so we couldn't see anything other than you know, 10, 20 feet in front of us. And uh, we kept going around and looking for these things. And this was the, the sketch that uh, Peter came up with showing the uh, hydrothermal deposits on this uh, terrace here. And then, you know, we're talking about, you know, maybe 10 meters here on this. And, but he did get uh, 
some photos. We got a lot of photos and actually were able to collect some of the samples. And this was part of the sample recovered from the hydrothermal deposit. Uh, most of the interior is white, fibrous talc with patches of green spectite and pyrotite crystals. And then uh, we were able to, to eventually map some of the uh, bottom sediments here. And then uh, this is the later work, I think, with um, the uh, Alvin diving. Is that right? And no, we actually went through some of the plumes and got temperatures and stuff. And while that discovering what's called, I think it's called a pagoda, right? And it would come up, and you, and this was the, the hypothesis of how it was growing and forming, and then there was stuff coming out the edges of the side of the pagoda. And you can see here that the uh, conducted heat flow at well-located stations and survey were calculated with a fit of measure time gradients to a linear, non-conducted model, uh, plotted and log nearly convenience distance from hydrothermal deposits estimated by visual and CDF observation for an outlet to within two to ten meters. And so, um, you know, within about uh, 400 meters of the uh, hydrothermal vents, you've got some of the highest heat flow up here, and then as you get further away, of course, you'd expect lower heat flow. And this is an interesting profile along here, and this is in the um, uh, northern gulf, I think. And you can, no, the southern gulf, and you can see here the, the heat flow and the, and the um, deep toe diving uh, shows that these coincided with these sills that were uh, in there. So anyway, thanks for listening.